So I was just saying, while we have the spaciousness, it can be nice to really take the time to find a posture or the posture that would be more supportive for this moment, rather than just our, our habit, our default. Yeah, so good, everyone. And I, I know you have a little while. I want to get to the restroom. I don't know about the start. I would like to come up with you. Does that improve the sound, Julie? Okay. Is it, would it be preferable if it was closer in more? Or is it, are you, is it okay? It's good. Sounds good to me. Jimmy doesn't know how it sounds. He's just being responsible. <laughs> yeah. I've shared this before, but I remember having the opportunity to practice for 10 days in silence of a positive retreat in Thailand. And it was the first time I'd done anything like that. And we were led by Thai, a Thai monk, the abbot of the monastery, uh, the international Dharma Hermitage of Ajahn Buddha Dasa, it's called Wat Son Mok. And of course, there's lots of teachings. We had the Thai abbot teaching us, and then there's a English monk we received a lot of instruction from him each day working through the Anapanasati Sutta. And one of the things that he offered that stayed with me, he's like, take your time to get your posture. Okay, because you want to be as comfortable as possible for the duration of your sit instead of like just like, okay, I'm here I am, let's go. And then you're like, oh, wait a minute. So really taking taking that time. And I find I certainly forget regularly but that we can take that time in whatever we might be doing. And not just about our posture and an activity, but we can take a little more time to feel in to something. Our urban lives, our modern lives can get so full and so busy that we're not tending to ourselves or caring for ourselves, not tending to or caring for the moment. And I think with technology, hi, I think with technology, especially, I know I find myself, perhaps you do too, suddenly I notice I'm in an uncomfortable position. I've been in it for a long time. It's like, wait a minute. <laughs> what if before we started, we like, oh, check, okay, how is this? Right? Because the phone or the computer or whatever the device is, it sucks us in and the awareness of the other stuff just fades away least of which what this body might need. So taking the time tonight as a practice, how can I support my body in this moment? And it might be a, a large activity, like going to the bathroom or getting a glass of water, might be one more layer, one less layer, might be standing or lying down instead of sitting. Maybe it's walking because you notice you're sleepy or the mind is really busy and something a little bit bigger. To hold your attention will be beneficial. Walking's great. Enjoying that experience as well. But discerning for yourself rather than being told what to do. Listening in, recognizing, oh, this, this, this feels good now for this moment. And then as we're practicing in stillness, some wisdom might arise, but some adjustment would be beneficial. Great. You make the adjustment with care, with love, with tenderness, with kind attention, with mindfulness, aware of the impetus to make the adjustment, aware of the movement of the adjustment, and aware of the results. And of course, if we just keep adjusting and keep adjusting and keep adjusting, we never get to settle. It's not an invitation to constantly be seeking something unattainable, but an invitation to listen in, to care for ourselves. Mm 
where they're most well suited to that. Someone else might try to out of love or care. We're really weird. We're the ones who can do it the best, but we have to practice. We're most well suited at caring for ourselves. So find in your posture, and if it's supportive for you, you might enjoy a few big breaths. It's not typically how I begin, but some people find it's really helpful to encourage, invite, and find the breath to be big. I would add soft and gentle. If the nostrils are clear, if the nostrils are clear, breathing in and out through the nostrils. And allowing, inviting, encouraging the breath. Rest into its natural rhythm. Whatever breath and depth might be there, not trying to make it any particular way, but rather recognizing well, this is a sensation of breath in this moment, moment by moment. Open. Alert. Sorry. Noticing how it feels, right? Not a mind probing curiosity, but a curiosity about the felt experience of the moment, the sensory experience. Each experience, all conditioned experience, all families. None excluded. They all can be held in the field of awareness. all thoughts and emotions. All sounds and sights.
our physical sensations. Our smells. Nothing left out. Everything and can be held in the field of awareness. Rooting down through the feet and seat. We'll lift and up to the crown of the head, lengthening. And broadening out through the shoulder. Taking up your space and reaching into community, reaching into the world with dignity, with an open heart and mind. Resting here, receptive, alert, curious, relaxed, open. As always, I invite you to practice in the way that most supports you. And I'll offer some ways to explore if you like. You might explore simply resting in awareness in an open way. Noticing a range of experience arising and passing. And practicing cultivating the ability to simply rest in awareness without regard for, regard to, regard of what it is that you are aware of. Practicing knowing observing the experience of knowing, being aware. And of course, it comes and goes, like everything, it's all impermanent, it's all conditioned, but we can practice that. Oh, this is how it feels in the heart, in the body, in the gut, when I am awake, aware, alert, Resting into that experience. One of the reasons I enjoy practicing with that so much is then when aversion or resistance or clenching or tightening in my heart, mind, or body arises, 
I can simply know this. And then knowing holds me. And I am less likely to be swept away by the aversion or the desire for things to be other than they are. Like, oh yeah, I, there's a virgin there. Cool. Thanks for letting me know. It's a very different experience. Or maybe you'd be more supported by resting in to a more quote unquote constant object breath or sound or some sensation of the body or this whole body resting in her. Great. You do you. Your practice your way. Trusting your own heart and gut. Or you might practice inclining the heart mind toward pleasant. By cultivating joy or gratitude or appreciation. Or even cultivating mindfulness and knowing, oh, this is how it feels to be mindful and the joy of that. Lots to play with. Choosing your own adventure and settling in without practice. for about 20, 25 minutes. Three bells to bring us in to relative silence and two bells to bring us out. Enjoy, enjoy coming home to yourself, coming home to each arising and passing present moment. Coming home to presence. Mindfulness does not care what it is mindful of.
continuing to rest in awareness, expanding the field of awareness into movement, loosening into how the body might want to move or be moved, and acting from that place of wisdom, discernment. Offer yourself kindness and love through this act of movement. Being aware of the change from stillness into movement and noticing how it feels as much as you can. You know, not, not tight, not grasping, but open. And then as the heart, mind, and body are ready, expanding into sight, maybe standing up and stretching, discerning what this heart, mind, and body, or what would support this heart, mind, and body. I've talked a little bit recently about wise effort or right effort that has four component parts. I'm to split it in half. <laughs> there's the unwholesome and there's the wholesome and then two on each side of when it's there and when it's not there. So it can be, a, I find that thinking of it that way can be a simpler way to remember what it, what this is, this wise effort or right effort. So the way that I'm holding it these days is we notice, we practice to notice when an unwholesome mindset has arisen. Anger, fear, greed, kind of notice that we're having some deluded thought, which is like already we're not so deluded when we notice it. Some self-judgment, some story, some woulda, coulda, shoulda, right? That's delusion. This view or belief, it's like, oh, I, ah, I don't know, actually. And when we notice it, sometimes the noticing allows us to see, oh, this is impermanent, this is just passing. And sometimes the noticing allows us to embrace it and offer ourselves kindness or tenderness or care or to let go of it or to incline the mind kind of more broadly. Like, what else is going on here? And sometimes that's feeling the body or the breath or noticing what's coming through the eyes or the nose or something like that. What else is here? or consciously, as Thich Nhat Hanh would say, changing the channel. Consciously saying, oh, I'm gonna incline my heart mind in this direction. I'm going to attend to this other thing. So there are other ways, but those are some of the ways that I've been finding are really supportive. But if I notice, oh, there's an unwholesome mind state here, to let it go, to allow it to pass, right? It's not fighting it or pushing it away or like trying to throttle it. That doesn't work so well. Pretty painful. But it's like, oh. And I have had plenty of unwholesome mind states today. And it's like, oh, hi. Oh, hi. <laughs> and my my favorite question, which some of you have heard a lot, is like, well, how can I care for myself in this moment? And when that shows up as a result of an unwholesome mind state, that's a beautiful moment. Like, that's why I practice. Maybe not the only reason, but like, if that's all that I got, like, that's enough. Because then there's freedom from all this shit, because there's plenty of shit. First of all, you don't get to avoid it. It's here. And running from it or trying to change it is not the path. I was like, oh, hi. Hi, I got you. It's okay. 
and a small experience of that that happened to me today is that I chose to walk here and I usually ride my bike. So it wasn't exactly how much time I needed and I wanted to have enough time. So I was quite early and I didn't have my key. So I was like, okay. And I did some walking meditation on the street behind the center. It was like cold a little bit on one side of the street, hot a little bit on the other side of the street. It's okay. You know, either of those is not going to be perfect. And they both have some pleasantness to them and appreciating that and noticing that. And then just walking and finding my mood lifting and then walking on the sunny side of the street. I walk right for a while on the shady side because I walk over here in the sun. Right balance. And then walking on the sunny side, I saw a lime a lime tree. I saw a lime, it's probably just a lemon, but I saw a tree that had a fruit on it. Those are dark green. And it caught my eye. And then I paid attention for a moment and I smelled it. And I love the fragrance of lemon blossoms. I just think it's so beautiful. And I'm such a green type, but I'm like, oh, where, where is it? Where is it? I'm like, so I'm like move around the tree to get a better nostril vantage point of the blossom. And it was actually where I had started. But I had an openness enough to, it was like, oh, and then I just allowed myself to savor the pleasantness of that. Like I wasn't trying to chase away whatever. I was like, oh, hi, this is here. And then similarly, when I was in the shadow side of the street, I suddenly was in a patch of sun. I was like, oh, this is pleasant. And stopping and being in the pleasant, like not chasing after it or grasping it, but just savoring it. So this is wise effort. Right? It's like, oh, this is what's here. So an unwholesome, we notice, we recognize unwholesome mind state is present, has arisen. And we do all we can to transform or to allow it to run its course. Or we recognize an absence of an unwholesome mind state. And we appreciate that. Right? Oh, this doesn't suck. No, it's okay. Oh, that shitty mood. Oh, it's past. Awesome. Or that grief, it's not present right now. It's not raining, right? It was pouring rain two days ago. Talk about Anicca. Like, oh, hi. And then on the other side, and a, a wholesome mindset has arisen. We notice it. We appreciate it. We do what we can to sustain it. Or we know that an unwholesome mindset, excuse me, or we know that a wholesome mindset has not arisen. And we do what we can to, to help it a little bit. And so that's part of what, what I was trying to point to very gently of one of the ways we could have practiced this even is like actually inclining the heart mind towards joy or appreciation. Gratitude, love, mindfulness. There are other wholesome mindsets, but those are some basic ones that I think that there's some ease to cultivate. Like you can just say, oh, okay, I want to be mindful. And maybe you can only be mindful for that moment that immediately preceded the thought, I want to be mindful. But that's enough when we string those together. And the same is true with, with joy, with gratitude, with appreciation, with inclining the heart mind to notice beauty, right? to notice what doesn't suck, what Thich Nhat Hanh would call the non toothache Like, oh, it's okay. It's okay. You know, I think all of you probably, that we have a negativity bias. It's the nature of the mind. It's it's how, probably not the only thing, but a key component to how this organism was able to journey from this single cell organism to this complex one. There's no one knows what was wrong. We're like, ah, get out of here, right? We have this fight, play, fear, fawn, freeze, like whatever response to survive. And it served our ancestors very well. And maybe it doesn't serve us so well all the time anymore. But we have this negativity bias to notice what's wrong. No problem. And we want to cultivate the other side of that so that we can have a little bit more balance. And we're not just always looking for the problem, looking for the problem, looking for the problem. We're going to find it. You know, there's something out there to be worried about or mad about or sad about. or And we can look towards other things. It makes me think of a Yes magazine. Like, you know, you can look... You can look towards other things. <laughs> Doesn't always have to be doom and gloom. And it's not to avoid the doom and gloom. We're trying to fix everything or bare our hands, heads in the sand like an ostrich. 
And so here we are with this negativity bias and we can think that we can't do anything right or everything we do is wrong or some story like that, or that when we have a pain, it's our fault. It's like, you no, know, there's a pain, there's a pain. And rather than just being tossed between I'm the best and I'm the worst, neither of which is true ever, neither is true ever. It's like, oh, what if, what if we had a North star we were aligning towards and we were guiding ourselves towards so that we knew you know, we were on the path, that we were moving in the direction of wise speech, wise action, wise livelihood. We were moving towards kindness and consideration. Thankfully, there is such a thing that was offered by the Buddha and offered by other teachers over the years, which is the precepts. And it's the first Monday of the month. And so we have a custom at Spiritual Friends Sangha of reciting precepts in one form or another. And since we recited precepts in Pali quite recently, it seemed like it made sense to go to Plum Village and to receive together this greater elaboration of these mindfulness trainings. And so the precepts were developed 2,600 years ago, simple, clean, Practices of refraining, you know, refraining from taking the life of any living being, refraining from taking that which is not offered, refraining from misuse of sexual energy, refraining from harsh or untruthful speech, and refraining from consumption of intoxicants or substances that can cloud the mind. Like, really clear, it wasn't as long as a do all this stuff. It was like, just don't do these things and you'll be happier. Things are a little bit easier. You don't feel so shitty about yourself because you didn't fuck up in these ways. So it's like, oh, okay. It's a little bit more attainable. And even if we just practice with one of them and we reflect on how we've held that, it can lift our spirit. Then we feel like, oh yeah, I didn't kill anything. And I mean, nothing, right? Not just human being. But so Chris has a pile of pieces of paper. And if each of you would read one of the five mindfulness trainings, that would be great. And I know Chris will pass them out for me. And I know that some of us, and Julie will post them on the Zoom world. And I know that some of us being able to read along is really helpful. And that just receiving something in an auditory way doesn't work. So there's another set of them that Jimmy has. So if anyone would be supported by being able to read along, you can go walk, walk over to him and say, hey, Jimmy, please, can you, can you give those to me? And he'll give them to you, the whole set. Is that not clear, Lisa? You're looking for you. No, good. I didn't hear it, sorry. Like anything. Oh, yeah, it's what the mind does. So if you know yourself, and you know that listening, you just get distracted, that it would be helpful for you to read along. There's a complete set on that chair that you can go and pick up. And if there are a couple of people who would like to read along, it's printed in a pretty good size font. So you could sit around it together. It doesn't have to be just for one person. Okay. Anybody want to collect those? Or is everyone going to just listen? Fabo, all right. So these are the five mindfulness trainings. And as I said, they're rooted in those five basic precepts. And without all the history of Thich Nhat Hanh and the order of interbeing, Tay decided that it would be helpful to give them a little more oomph <laughs> so that people could practice them more wholeheartedly so they might be a little bit more available and accessible. And so created what is called the five mindfulness trainings. And that was probably like in the late 60s. And so over the years, they have developed and changed over time as the community of the Order of Interbeing has found ways that might be more supportive to modify them. So the ones that we're reading today were revised in June of 2022. And I think they match what's currently on the Plum Village site, which is what, great, which is what is on the Zoom. And so they should all, um, might all be the same words. I might have changed a pronoun here and there, but I don't, I don't think I did. So here are some words from Thich Nhat Hanh on the five mindfulness trainings. The five mindfulness trainings are one of the most concrete ways to practice mindfulness. 
They are non-sectarian and their nature is universal. They are true practices of compassion and understanding. I love that. Practices, right? Not ideas, notions, concepts, but practices of compassion and understanding. All spiritual traditions have their equivalent to the five mindfulness trainings. The first training is to protect life, to decrease violence in oneself, in the family, and in society. The second training is to practice social justice, generosity, not stealing, and not exploiting other living beings. The third is the practice of responsible sexual behavior in order to protect individuals, couples, families, and children. The fourth is the practice of deep listening and loving speech to restore communication and reconciliation. The fifth is about mindful consumption to help us not bring toxins and poisons into our body or mind. So you already see in that there's just a little bit more there than just the simple precepts that I offered. And in a little here, full paragraphs or whole pages expounding on these trainings. And I want to say that something that has shown up in the community in order to intervene, particularly around the third mindfulness training, which Tai says here, or Tay says here, responsible sexual behavior in order to protect individuals, couples, families, and children, is that no one gets to decide what's responsible sexual behavior except for you and your people. Right? So it is not like saying that there's a problem with polyamory or open relationships, it's like finding what works. It's not harming anyone. You're not harming yourself and not harming another. And so there's been a continued lifting up of how can this speak to, to all people or to more people? I'm trying all people, but I'm sure it fails as everything does, but that's not important to me to, to lift up. And the fifth training also, some people think of the fifth training about just not getting stoned or getting high or using drugs or drinking alcohol or something like that. But I feel like for me, being someone who's not interested in those things anyway, for me, it's a practice of recognizing what are substances that I might be ingesting that it's out the mind. Right? And sometimes it's just like stories that my mind develops that I believe. It's like, no. Put it down. It's delusion. It's clouding the mind. It's getting me totally confused because I buy it. I buy it. And whew, every time I turn into social media or turn towards social media, I suffer instantly. Instantly. So mostly I, I don't engage in social media. And as you know, my mom died. And I'm having a memorial in a couple of months. And people want to know about it. And it's the medium that is most available and accessible to people. So there I am in the health realm of social media. <laughs> and wow, I suffer so much. I suffer so much. And so learning, and this might be true for many of us, not the social media part, because I know we all have different relationships with it, but technology, learning to use the tool for ourselves, like we use it rather than being used and abused by it. I have not figured that out, except for the you know, monochrome my phone and use do not disturb and airplane mode and all that. Like I'm, the no is, is pretty available to me. It's the using it wisely that is continuing to be so hard. So that's a part of this fifth mindfulness training as it is held in the Pongo community in the order of intervening. Okay, more work from Ty. And I'm still like almost 20 years into practicing in that community. I'm still trying to learn how to say that word properly. It's a terrible American pronunciation. Tay is a little closer than Thai, but I was taught Thai, so it's still my habit. So Tay. As these are Tay's words. The five mindfulness trainings are based on the precepts developed during the time of the Buddha to be the foundation of practice for the entire lay practice community. That's us, us non-monastics. I, Thich Nhat Hanh, have translated these precepts for modern times because mindfulness is at the foundation of each one of them. With mindfulness, we are aware of what is going on in our bodies. 
our feelings, our mind, and the world. And we avoid, out of love and care and kindness and compassion, we avoid doing harm to ourselves and others. Mindfulness protects us, our families, and our society. Right? Sometimes people are like, that mindfulness thing, that meditation thing is really self-indulgent. You're just like doing a bunch of navel-gazing. But when we take care of ourselves and we're kind and tender toward ourselves, we're nice to everyone we interact with. So it does, it protects us, our feelings, and our society. When we are mindful, we can see that by refraining from doing one thing, we can prevent another thing from happening. Have you noticed that in your life? It's like there's this a puncher or proliferation. Now it goes both ways, but we were praying from one thing, we're, we're preventing another thing from happening. There's a, a saying from the Buddha, maybe it's in the Dhammapada, I might show up a few places, but. What the mind frequently reflects upon becomes the inclination of the mind. So if we're practicing the inclined, we're practicing inclining our minds toward mindfulness, towards love, or towards care, or toward compassion, or generosity, or a little self-love. If we're practicing inclining the mind in that direction, it becomes the habit of the mind. And you're always practicing something. So if you're not paying very much attention, you might be practicing shitting on yourself, and then that becomes the habit of the mind. Like, oh, right. Oh, there's that subject when I thought again. So we just notice it. Okay, hi, I got you. Of course, that's the habit, no problem. So if we, when we are mindful, we can see that by refraining from doing one thing, we can prevent another thing from happening. We arrive at our own unique insights. It is not something imposed on us by an outside authority. Love that. Practicing the mindfulness trains, therefore, helps us to be more calm and concentrated and brings more insight and enlightenment. I would say that also helps us to be more accepting of ourselves and others. It's not all about calmness. Like, don't, don't be fooled. And if you're interested in reading more about that, a recent, maybe not so recent, 2009 publication on this is called Happiness, Essential Mindfulness Practices. These then are the five mindfulness trainings. The five mindfulness trainings represent the Buddhist vision for global spirituality and ethic. They are a concrete expression of the Buddhist teachings on the four noble truths and the noble eightfold path, the path of right or wise understanding and true love, leading to healing, transformation and happiness for ourselves and for the world. To practice the five mindfulness trainings is to cultivate the insight of intervene or right view or wise view, which can remove all discrimination, intolerance, anger, fear, and despair. If we live according to the five mindfulness trainings, we are already on the path of a bodhisattva, knowing we're on that path we are not lost in confusion about our life in the present or in fears about the future. Knowing we are on that path, we are not lost in confusion about our life in the present or fears about the future. May we have the first mindfulness training. I'm just listening with a calm mind and open heart, noticing whether it's resonance or dissonance and tending to and being with yourself. All right, we might need the mic for this. Sorry, girl. Can you hear me? Is it working? Okay. The first mindfulness training, um, reverence for life. Aware of the suffering caused by the destruction of life, 
I am committed to cultivating the insight of interbeing and compassion and learning ways to protect the lives of people, animals, plants, and minerals. I am determined not to kill, not to let others kill, and not to support any act of killing in the world in my thinking or in my way of life. Seeing that harmful actions arise from anger, fear, greed, and intolerance, which in turn come from dualistic and discriminative thinking, I will cultivate openness, non-discrimination, and non-attachment to views in order to transform violence fanaticism and dogmatism in myself and in the world. Enjoying a few breaths or a few moments of resting into your body, feeling the resonance or dissonance of those words, noticing how it lands. Familiar or unfamiliar, being with it all. Maybe an opportunity to practice wise effort. And moving on to the second mindfulness training. And the, just to say, the microphone is specifically for the Zoom recording. It's not for amplification for this room. So still projecting your voice across the room. Second mindfulness training, true happiness. Aware of the suffering caused by exploitation, social injustice, stealing, and oppression, I am committed to practicing generosity in my thinking, speaking, and acting. I am determined not to steal and not to possess anything that should, not, that should belong to others. And I will share my time, energy, and material resources with those who are in need. I will practice looking deeply to see that the happiness and suffering of others are not separate from my own happiness and suffering. That true happiness is not possible without understanding and compassion. And that running after wealth, fame, power, and sensual pleasures can bring much suffering and despair. I'm aware that happiness depends on my mental attitude and not on external conditions and that I can live happily in the present moment simply by remembering that I already have more than enough conditions to be happy. I am committed to practicing right livelihood so that I can help reduce the suffering of living beings on earth and stop contributing to climate change. Noticing how the body responds. Perhaps jumping out into the future or back into the past. It's okay. Notice this and the rest into now. If we're listening and we find ourselves floating off, sometimes I find it helpful to repeat the words in my head as I'm listening to help me listen in more. You might try that if you like. And the third mindfulness training. The third mindfulness training, true love. Aware of the suffering caused by sexual misconduct, I am committed to cultivating responsibility and learning ways to protect the safety and integrity of individuals, couples, families, and society. Knowing that sexual desire is not love and that sexual activity motivated by craving always harms myself as well as others. 
I am determined not to engage in sexual relationships without mutual consent, true love, and a deep long-term commitment. I resolve to find spiritual support for the integrity of my relationship from family members, friends, and Sangha with whom there is support and trust. I will do everything in my power to protect children from sexual abuse and to prevent couples and families from being broken by sexual misconduct. Seeing that body and mind are interrelated, I am committed to learn appropriate ways to take care of my sexual energy and to cultivate the four basic elements of true love, loving kindness, compassion, joy, and inclusiveness for the greater happiness of myself and others. Recognizing the diversity of human experience, I am committed not to discriminate against any form of gender, I, gender identity or sexual orientation. Practicing true love, we know that we will continue beautifully into the future. Feeling it in the body. Letting it absorb like the Dharma rain. Absorbing, allowing resonance or dissonance to be there. And continuing to the fourth mindfulness training. The fourth mindfulness training, loving speech and deep listening. Aware of the suffering caused by unmindful speech and the inability to listen to others, I am committed to cultivating loving speech and compassionate listening in order to relieve suffering and to promote reconciliation and peace in myself and among other people, ethnic and religious groups and nations. Knowing that words can create happiness or suffering, I'm committed to speaking truthfully, using words that inspire confidence, joy, and hope. When anger is manifesting in me, I am determined not to speak. I will practice mindful breathing and walking in order to recognize and to look deeply into my anger. I know that the roots of anger can be found in my wrong perceptions and lack of understanding of the suffering in myself and in the other person. I will speak and listen in a way that can help myself and the other person to transform suffering and see the way out of difficult situations. I am determined not to spread news that I do not know to be certain and not to utter words that can cause division or discord. I will practice right diligence to nourish my capacity for understanding, love, joy, and inclusiveness and gradually transform anger violence and fear that lie deep in my consciousness. I have to give a quick shout out to the last one. Gradually transform anger, violence, and fear that lie deep in my consciousness. I had been hearing and reading and practicing with that for so long before I heard it in this way where I was like, oh, that means we all have, we all, every, like, those words are there because this is a universal deal. 
I don't know about you, but there's this way that I feel like, oh, there's something wrong with me. Like it's my particular maladaptive, whatever, that there's all this fear. I don't, I don't tend for violence. And my anger is usually just like a mask because I'm sad or hurt or something. But I've come to see how much fear. So it's that like when I heard it that way, I'm like, oh, right, that got on that piece of paper. Because there's this recognition, this is a universal experience. Really, it was supportive for me. So I'm going to put the spotlight on that. Okay, so a little bit of silence before we go on to five. Feeling the body, the heart, the mind. Presidents, dissidents, it's all good. What's here for you? You're discerning for yourself. From the fifth mindfulness chain. The fifth mindfulness training, nourishment and healing. Aware of the suffering caused by unmindful consumption, I am committed to cultivating good health, both physical and mental, for myself, my family, my society and my society by practicing mindful eating, drinking, and consuming. I will practice looking deeply into how I consume the four kinds of nutrients, namely edible foods, sense impressions, volition, and consciousness. I am determined not to gamble or to use alcohol, drugs, or any other products which contain toxins, such as certain websites, electronic games, TV programs, films, magazines, books, and conversations. I will practice coming back to the present moment to be in touch with the refreshing, healing, and nourishing elements in me and around me not letting regrets and sorrow drag me back into the past, nor letting anxieties, fear, or craving pull me out of the present moment. I am determined not to try to cover up loneliness, anxiety, or other suffering by losing myself in consumption. I will contemplate interbeing and consume in a way that preserves peace, joy, and well-being in my body and consciousness and in the collective body and consciousness of my family, my society, and the earth. Noticing how it feels inside and the heart and the gut and the body more broadly. Being with yourself, being with your direct experience and observing.
reflecting on your hopes and aspirations and intentions, appreciating yourself for showing up for yourself, for sangha, for meditation, for this practice of the cultivation of kind attention, the cultivation of awareness and love. And may any benefit that may have been generated from practicing together, may it nourish us and inform our actions and thereby nourish and impact everyone and everything we come in contact with. And through them, through those actions and through those people, may it ripple out to all beings. May the fruits of our practice be of benefit to all beings and bring peace and liberation for all. Thank you so much for your practice, for joining this, this offering of Spiritual Friends Sangha at the San Francisco Dharma Collective. This is Mindful Mondays, and your practice is, is really the greatest gift of dana, of, of generosity that you can offer. And we live in this modern time and place. So if you have time or energy to volunteer at the Dharma Collective, or you have the pockets that would allow you to support the collective or to support the teachings, donations of time, money, energy, are all warmly welcomed and not required. This is not a favor service kind of situation. This is an opportunity for all of us, me included, to practice dana, to practice the, the act of giving. And it's been said that the Buddha said, if you knew as I do the gift of giving, you would not let a moment pass in which you didn't practice sharing what you had. So, And then the last piece about that that's, that's alive for me is that sometimes the teachings are broken down into three arenas of um, hmm. Dana, the act of giving, samadhi, this practice, cultivation of awareness, concentration, and sila. Sometimes, sometimes they're, they're broken up in different way that includes panya or wisdom, depends which tradition you're coming in. So if you just think of those four things of sila, which we were just experiencing this five mindfulness trainings, samadhi, which, you know, maybe you're not like having the, the deepest collectedness of samadhi, but the practice of mindfulness as we're engaged in it's it's leading towards smile, it's leading for concentration and collectedness. So that's two. Dana is the third one. And the fourth is wisdom that arises through those things. Like that's how Panya shows up because we're practicing, not because we read something and now we're like, oh, I know everything. So any one of those doorways supports you. And here we are engaging in so many of them. So are there more announcements that would be helpful to me? Okay. There's great stuff happening at the Dharma Collective all the time. You can check the website. I noticed that Eve is offering half days on a monthly basis the next few months. I highly recommend that. It's nice to have a longer period of time for practice. And I'll just mention that outside of the collective, if you're interested, tomorrow night and each month on the first Tuesday, some monastics from the Bayagiri Monastery, which is in the tradition of Ajahn Chah. It's up in Ukiah. Some monastics from that monastery come down to Berkeley, to the Berkeley Buddhist Monastery, which is just a couple blocks from the downtown Berkeley Bard Station, so super accessible. And they come every month. They don't come January, February, March, because they're on their own range retreat, but now it's April. So they'll be there the first Tuesday each month if that is of interest to you. I'm planning to go tomorrow and I offer that as a way to continue to deepen your practice. All right, peace.